Good afternoon. I'm Graham Allison, the director of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. And it's my honor and privilege to welcome you here to the forum this afternoon for an extremely lively uh, discussion and debate about some of the most urgent issues on the current national security agenda for the US, including Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan. And we have as our guest today, thanks to uh, our Institute of Politics fellow who's here with us, Brett McCurk, uh, Ryan Crocker. Brett is going to introduce Ryan. Uh, Ryan is not going to talk. And then we're going to have the floor open for questions, answers, and discussion. Let me just remind those of you who don't know Brett that he's an Institute of Politics fellow here for the term. And so he's here almost every day. And you'll have an opportunity to go see him. Some, I know, some of you are in his study group. Brett comes to us from having recently been at the National Security Council, where he was part of the strategic review for President Obama, and in the Bush administration was prior to that part, uh, indeed was the senior director at the National Security Council, working with uh, colleagues on the review that led to the surge and the management of the surge. Prior to that, he was on the, in the coalition authority right after the toppling of Saddam. Uh, he's uh, in his study group covering some of these topics and is seeped in the complexities of Iraq uh, and continues to be fascinated by the topic. Before he went to the National Security Council, he graduated from Columbia where he was uh, editor of the Law Review and clerked for the Supreme Court. So he's a great role model for a number of our students who are hoping to grow up and work on jobs of the sort that he's had. And we're very glad that he's here at the Institute of Politics this term and that he's brought Brett for us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Graham. It is my my great honor to introduce Ambassador Ryan Crocker, one of America's preeminent diplomats, a former colleague of mine, and a friend. Uh, Ryan's story is an American story. Born in Spokane, Washington, educated at Whitman College in Walla Walla, uh, Ryan set out to see the world. At 21, as a self-described long-haired college kid, he packed his bag and went hitchhiking, a journey that took him from Washington to places like Amsterdam, Kabul, and Calcutta. He then joined the Foreign Service, where there were early postings in the 70s in Iran and Iraq, where he chronicled Saddam Hussein's, Saddam Hussein's rise to power. His assignments since then have been some of our nation's toughest and uh, most dangerous. In 1983, he was in Beirut when a suicide bomber attacked the US Embassy, killing 63 people. Ryan was in the embassy that day with his wife, Christine. He has since served as the ambassador to Lebanon, Kuwait, Syria, Pakistan, and Iraq and since 9-11 has stood watch on the front lines for our country, in Kabul, Islamab Islamabad, and then Baghdad. I first met Ryan in March 2007 in the Oval Office as he met with President Bush for about an hour before departing for Iraq. Ryan was charged with turning around a rapidly deteriorating war, turning around the very situation he warned as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in 2003 might occur if we intervened in Iraq. I'll never forget that oval meeting. Uh, Iraq was in terrible shape. The surge had barely begun. Ryan never sugarcoated the difficulties, and he never would, garnering the nickname from President Bush over time, Mr. Sunshine. <laughs> that meeting for me was the embodiment of service, really what this school is all about, answering the call to serve for a cause you may not have chosen, but uh, under the most daunting circumstances, when your country needs you, you go. Over the next two years, I'd come to work very closely with Ryan and with General Petraeus and so many others in Baghdad. Uh, one year ago, on this very day, we were working to negotiate what became two international agreements, a security agreement governing the presence and withdrawal of US forces from Iraq, and a longer-term strategic framework agreement setting a foundation for bilateral relations between the US and Iraq in the areas of commerce, education, diplomacy, and trade. At this hour, about 11 p.m. in Baghdad, a year ago today, we were probably coming back from an endless negotiation session uh, with the Iraqis or from, with, from a VTC with Washington, wondering if these negotiations could ever possibly succeed. 
but they did succeed, and they succeeded against tremendous odds. Um, never before in American history had an agreement to govern the presence of U.S. forces on a foreign land been negotiated under such intense time pressure, in the open, under a full media spotlight, in the midst of active combat, and with a historical backdrop in which similar agreements had led to the fall of Iraqi regimes, including the first Shia prime minister in Iraq's history, and the rise of Ayatollah Khomeini next door in Iran. That was history that our Iraqi colleagues knew. They had lived it. It informed their own positions in decision making, and we had to account for it. And for, fortunately for our country, it was a history that Ryan Crocker had studied, lived, and breathed. Thanks to his diplomacy and credibility, with the Congress, with the Iraqis, with the President, and with the American people, we managed from the surge to the ratification of these agreements to put Iraq in a more stable place, to give it a chance, and to allow a new administration to enter office without Iraq being another crisis in its inbox. Ryan, one year ago today, I never thought I would say this, but I, I tremendously miss those days. Um, I miss our Iraqi counterparts who drove us nuts. I miss the tug and pull in the bureaucracy. And most of, most of all, I miss, I miss working with you. But like so many who've worked with you over the years, including my colleague Megan O'Sullivan, who's in the front row, um, I'll never forget the lessons I learned from you. That diplomacy, diplomacy is about relationships, culture, history, dispassion, flexibility, pragmatism, and perseverance. It's about advancing your own country's interests, not by force of will, but by understanding and empathizing with those across the table from you. Seeing the world from where they sit as a critical element to achieving what we need. Those lessons are timeless, they're tested, but they're too often forgotten. And they're lessons that, thanks to you, I and so many who have served with you will never forget. So Ryan, on behalf of the Harvard community, I'm truly honored and excited that you've come across the country to share your experience with us. And thank you for being here. Well, thank you uh, very much, Brett, for that uh, generous introduction. Um, there are um, a number of ways in which my uh, career can be encapsulated. I, of course, uh, like the way that Brett just did it. Um, there, there is another way, and that would be to imagine um, a pictorial representation of every major setback to U.S. interests in the Middle East in the last quarter of a century. And if you could imagine that series of photographs, I would be in every one of them, second row, third from the left. Uh, um, I, I'd kind of like to, to reintroduce, reintroduce Brett, uh, Mutual Admiration Society here. Um, uh, this institution is gifted in so many ways, uh, the most important, uh, of course, being the, um, the fellows and faculty that uh, are present here with you. And um, two of those today are Brett McGurk and Megan O'Sullivan, who, um, uh, between them, uh, were both the architects and the implementers, um, uh, the drawers of the map um, and the navigators on that map um, that saw us move from uh, the imminence of disaster in Iraq, uh, not to a point of victory, you will never hear me use that word uh, with respect to Iraq, but to a far, far better place. Uh, this nation owes them a, um, a huge debt. Uh, finally, I'd like to... Um, uh, thank all of you for being here today. Um, I'm keenly conscious that I stand before you in the, uh, the same time slot as the second game of the National League Championship Series. Um, and um, since this is a town in which baseball used to be played, um, I know that's... Uh, <laughs> I know that's important here. Uh, uh, let me also acknowledge um, uh, my friend for many, many years, Dick Norton, Boston University and Oxford, um, uh, one of the, the, the great scholars uh, of this region. He knows it in its depth and in its complexity. Um, and um, again, he represents one of those great traditions in America, uh, that of the soldier scholar uh, for many years, a commissioned officer in the United States Army. It's great to see you again, Dick. Um, The Middle East and the Long War. Um, I, I've got this map up not to suggest that you are geographically challenged in any way, 
Um, but I'll come back to that in a moment because it, it may be something of an American attribute. Our, our difficulties in the Middle East, I think, often start with definitions. Just what do we mean? What is the Middle East? Um, and this map uh, doesn't really capture it either. The State Department defines the Middle East one way. Uh, the Central Command uh, defines it another. The Department of Defense yet a third way. Um, I've kind of come up with my own formula of the, the broader Middle East uh, that uh, encompasses the Arab countries, uh, starting with Morocco in the west, um, extending through Iran, but also including Afghanistan and Pakistan. And this um, is for the um, uh, logically impeccable reason that I've served in all these places. Uh, uh, but there is something else to it. Um, uh, there are systemic commonalities, I think, uh, uh, to the states in this area, um, uh, not least for uh, practitioners and strategists uh, is the fact that our adversaries uh, see this as a common system. Um, uh, Al-Qaeda in Pakistan, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. Um, uh, there is also a pattern of interaction with the West. Um, I, I, I think that the, the broader Middle East arguably is the most interpenetrated major region of the world uh, in terms of its relations uh, with the West. Um, uh, you, you can pick almost any date to describe that interaction. I, I like to start with 1798, and we all know what happened in 1798. That was when Napoleon invaded Egypt. Uh, actually, most Americans have no idea that Napoleon ever did invade Egypt, uh, but he had some time on his hands between engagements in Europe uh, uh, and wasn't there for very long in any case. He quickly gave way to the British. Uh, but again, part of a modern history of the region uh, that has the West. Uh, uh, deeply and directly engaged, often with its military forces, um, um, and often with accompanying violence. Uh, as, as you look at that map, and again, I ask you to mentally extend it west to, to Morocco um, and carry it up to the uh, Indo-Pak border, uh, there really is only one area in that whole swath of uh, territory in which uh, Western states and their militaries were not in occupation for some length of time, and that is the, the center of the Arabian Peninsula, the, uh, the region known as Najd, and parts of Yemen. Everywhere else was. Um, and I think this does several things. Um, uh, it conditions how this region looks at the West. Um, we may... Uh, see our intentions in the noblest possible terms, uh, they will see our initiatives, uh, our intentions, and our actions against this historical backdrop. Um, it also, I think, has produced a, a distinctive political culture. Um, the, the countries, the, the peoples of the Middle East learned a long time ago um, that you can't keep the big guys from the West out. Um, whether it's the French, the British, the Russians, even the Italians, uh, you can't fight them in the field. Uh, so what you do is uh, once they're in, you reorganize, regroup, clinch up, um, and see how much pain they can take. Uh, they always caution you against sporting analogies. Here comes one. Uh, you know, you, you, you can't stop the outsiders uh, uh, with a big left hook. So again, clinch up, go for the ribs, see how much pain they can, they can stand. Uh, so uh, not to belabor the, uh, the history, but as Brett noted, uh, history is important. Um, that, I guess, would be my first lesson from this long war, um, uh, to try to understand the region in its own terms. Uh, this doesn't mean supporting or sympathizing necessarily, it simply means understanding. Uh, understanding what happened, particularly with respect to interaction with the West, 
uh, understanding the, the historical narratives of these countries, which may or may not uh, correspond with historical truth. Um, uh, it means, again, knowing something about the region in which we are involved. Uh, Americans are great people. There's no question about it. But we do have our limitations. Um, we tend to be challenged uh, geographically, hence the map, uh, and challenged a bit historically of, of, of not knowing what happened yesterday. We are a nation of today and tomorrow. Uh, uh, other countries, other cultures pay a lot of attention to their yesterdays, and uh, uh, we are in some significant um, peril um, if we do not do the same. Um, and there's a corollary to that that I'll come back to. Um, regimes may change very abruptly. Uh, political cultures tend to endure um, from regime to regime. You need to understand uh, what lies behind uh, the, uh, the events of the moment. Uh, a second lesson I've learned is, sounds pretty obvious, uh, which is that actions have consequences. Uh, uh, very major actions have very major consequences. Uh, and in many cases, these consequences are not something you can plan for or even foresee. Um, uh, I have talked uh, previously about not just first, second, and third order consequences, but 20th and 30th order consequences. Um, when, when major events are set in motion uh, in Lebanon, in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, major consequences ensue, uh, and they keep on coming for years and even for decades. Um, uh, so what kept me awake in the, um, uh, the nights before March 2003 uh, wasn't as much concern over deficits in planning, although they were certainly there. It was all the things that we couldn't identify uh, let alone plan for. So if you are contemplating major action, <clears throat> you have to be ready to assume major risk, and major risk uh, that is virtually unforeseeable um, and that will carry forward for a very long time. Um, uh, simply put, be careful what you get into, um, uh, certainly, certainly in this region. Um, and there is a corollary to that, uh, which is the need for strategic patience. Uh, if you are going to take a step, um, then you're committed, and you have to have the patience uh, to see a course through that you may at best dimly perceive at the time you cross the line of departure. Uh, and that, again, is a challenge for Americans. Um, we are not really well known as a patient people. Um, Give it to me today by God or at the absolute latest the day after tomorrow. Um, uh, don't talk to me about the long term. I've got other issues to get on with. Um, uh, and here again, I think a culture has developed um, around our impatience where our, um, our allies have come to fear it and our adversaries have come to count on it. Um, and I think you see this, again, uh, throughout the region, again, uh, uh, Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, other places as well. Um, and again, that, that takes me to a third lesson I've learned um, uh, in a long war, and these are all obviously interrelated. Um, if we need to be careful about committing we need to be even more careful about uncommitting. Uh, once you're in, um, you're in. That, that was a theme, if you recall, uh, of the testimony that uh, General Petraeus and I delivered before Congress in September of 2007. Um, you're tired of Iraq. You don't like the way it's going. It's costing too much in blood and treasure. OK, we, we get that. What are the alternatives? Um, uh, so it is, I think, extremely important uh, uh, for not just policymakers, but for populations in a democratic society to have serious debates 
uh, both about getting in, but equally or even more important about getting out, uh, because uh, those actions have consequences, again, uh, to the 30th and 40th order. Uh, I give you one example from um, something I was involved in um, uh, at about the same time as Professor Norton uh, in Lebanon in the early 80s. Um, um, uh, when we got, uh, or let me back up a bit, uh, when we took certain steps, um, uh, and the Israelis took certain steps uh, in 81 and 82, uh, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, um, that cemented a strategic alliance uh, between Damascus and Tehran. Uh, that was already building immediately after the 1979 revolution, uh, but the Israeli invasion cemented it. Uh, among other things, it led to the creation that summer of Hezbollah. Um, uh, we withdrew after uh, appalling losses, both um, military and civilian, in early 1984. The Israelis lasted a great deal longer. They eventually withdrew too. Uh, and the lesson that I think Damascus and Tehran absorbed about us um, was, um, again, it goes back to my earlier point, um, clinch up close, uh, uh, pound on the ribs. Uh, they will give up. They will get tired. They will go home. Uh, and I think that was very much the thinking motivating both capitals um, in 2006 in Iraq. Uh, that alliance was at work there, uh, as it had been in Lebanon, with the Syrians backing Baathi remnants and al-Qaeda, um, the Iranians backing extremist Shia militias, um, and it looked to them again as if a 25-year-old um, alliance, strategic vision, and a set of tactics was going to work again. Uh, we step forward instead of back, and I think uh, those capitals are still trying to figure out how to position themselves, uh, particularly the Iranians. And again, we can talk more about that if you're interested in the, uh, the question period. Uh, so wh what does all this mean applied to current issues? And I'll, I'll just touch on three areas very briefly. Um, in this brief time, I'm, I'm not going to talk about the Israeli uh, uh, Arab dimension of the Middle East, but happy to deal with that in questions. Um, Iraq, well first, six and a half years on, um, we're, we're persuaded it's got to be at least the bottom of the eighth, top of the ninth. Uh, uh, this movie's done. You know, I'm, I'm here to tell you it's still just getting underway. Um, uh, huge challenges have been met. Uh, Huge challenges remain. Huge challenges that neither we nor they can identify, I think, will emerge in the future. Um, uh, uh, we have seen sectarian violence mercil mercifully subside. Uh, we have seen ethnic tension, not yet violence, but tension uh, between Arab and Kurds rise. And overlaying those tensions is uh, something profoundly structural in the new Iraq. Uh, what are the proper relationships uh, between a federal government, a regional government in the north, and provincial governments? Um, sounds a little bit like our states' rights debates, which uh, took us about 87 years to resolve through and the, the bloodiest conflict in our history. Uh, these are hard issues, and the Iraqis will be wrestling with them uh, for some time to come. Um, related, again, the development of institutions. Uh, the role of the uh, Iraqi parliament, the Council of Representatives, and its authorities vis-a-vis -vis the executive branch, a subject of great contention. Um, if there is one single event uh, upcoming that I, I think is worth focusing on, if you're trying to see how things are going in Iraq, it would be the um, national elections scheduled for January assuming that the Council of Representatives will indeed produce an elections law like real soon. Um, yesterday would have been best. Um, Monday would be okay, but they've got to do it like now. Um, how those uh, national elections proceed, what their outcomes are, uh, I think will tell us uh, a considerable amount of uh, 
uh, about what Iraq looks like uh, moving ahead, at least into its uh, near-term future. Um, one thing that is different uh, in this new Iraq uh, is its orientation toward the West and the United States. Uh, Brett spoke of the um, agreements that we concluded at the end of 2008. Um, the security agreement attracted the most attention, uh, uh, but the long-term significance of the strategic framework agreement may be far greater. Um, and I note this now because uh, Prime Minister Maliki will be in Washington next week for uh, a trade and investment forum. Um, uh, perhaps that doesn't strike many as that surprising, but here is a Prime Minister who does not like to travel, um, who will be in Washington twice in three months. He was here in July, he's coming back for this conference. Um, Iraq, for the last 50 years, has defined itself uh, uh, in an adversarial relationship with the West and the U.S. You now have an Iraqi establishment, not just the Prime Minister, uh, virtually all of Iraq's political leaders are united on this point, who wish to see the country oriented toward the West. Um, uh, not just in terms of security, but uh, investment, trade, education. Um, uh, and again, I think that makes this a particularly important visit as we look for uh, potentially new directions uh, in an old region and an old political culture. Um, briefly on Iran, um, you know, the Iranian nuclear issue is very hot button right now. I, I find it useful, though, again, to look back a bit at Iran. Uh, Iran has always seen itself as a regional superpower, um, uh, starting with the Safavids, if not the Sasanians. I mean, this is uh, an issue millennia old, the tension between the Safavid and the Ottoman empires. Uh, in more modern times, the Shah clearly saw himself as a regional leader, and he projected power uh, through his conventional forces. The, deployment of the Iranian army to Oman uh, in the early 70s to help the Omanis put down a, um, uh, a South Yemeni-inspired rebellion, appreciated by the Omanis, but of course the Shah was signaling the region uh, that his army could deploy and fight well beyond its borders. Um, it was during the Shah's reign, not during the reign of the Ayatollahs, that the Iranians seized the three islands from the United Arab Emirates. Uh, uh, in 1970. So a revolution in Iran, quite literally a revolution, but a persistence, I think, of political culture. The Islamic Republic also projects powers beyond its borders and did so from its very early days. Uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, Hamas, uh, the Palestine Islamic Jihad, um, and even their archenemy, the Taliban. Uh, uh, a very different style, different set of tactics, but um, a, a remarkable similarity in uh, how Tehran views its role in the region, in my view. I, I, I go through this because I think it's instructive as one looks at the Iranian quest for a nuclear capability. Um, uh, I think that is rooted deeply in Iran's sense of itself. Uh, had the Shah never fallen, um, I think there's a very good chance that Iran might already have that capability. Uh, this means, uh, while I wish us all the very best of luck in deterring and dissuading and building the international consensus to shift the Iranians in this, it's going to be very hard because this, I think, is a quest rooted in their basic sense of who they are and what their role is in the region. Uh, finally and quickly on um, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, you know, here, here in a sense, the, the history is our own history. Um, uh, we've had the current debate before in a somewhat different form, obviously, um, when we decided that with the Soviets out of Afghanistan in 1989, we were done there too. Um, um, we knew it was going to be messy, but our strategic goals had been met. The rest of it didn't really matter. Um, 
Um, and we saw the process unfold that led to the ascendancy of the Taliban, um, uh, a safe operating environment for Al-Qaeda, and eventually 9-11. Um, um, now we have a policy review underway. Quite frankly, I thought we already had a policy on Afghanistan articulated by the president at the end of March um, in his speech on the 27th and the white paper that uh, was issued at that time. Um, uh, but there is a review. I only hope that it proceeds very quickly uh, to clearly articulated results because uh, once again, what we're seeing and I go back to my earlier points, um, a region wondering about the U.S.'s sense of resolve and strategic patience. Um, uh, this is obviously much on the minds of Afghan leaders. It is equally on the minds of those in Pakistan, um, a country of over 170 million people now facing a very determined Islamic insurgency on their own territory, as we've seen over these last several weeks, um, um, and, and wondering, um, is history about to repeat itself that the U.S. is going to get tired and impatient and go home? Um, uh, we have had a hugely uneven relationship with Pakistan, the most allied of allies for us in the, uh, uh, the 1970s, uh, the 1980s, um, and then the most sanctioned of adversaries, uh, starting in 1990. Um, uh, Pakistanis remember this very, very clearly, uh, even though most, uh, most Americans do not. Uh, and even when a positive initiative is taken, uh, such as the legislation uh, signed into effect uh, just yesterday for a $7.5 billion assistance package to Pakistan, uh, because it's conditioned. And not only is it conditioned in ways that Pakistanis, uh, both military and civilian, find overly intrusive, it requires uh, the Secretary of State to certify that Pakistan is doing the things the legislation specifies. And I just learned today uh, there is no national interest waiver. Um, uh, the Secretary has to make the certification, period. Uh, and so for Pakistanis, it's the Pressler Amendment of 1990 in prospect all over again. Um, uh, so again, we can, um, uh, we can talk about this in questions. Uh, it's not so much whether their reading or their narrative is correct. It is that it is their reading and their narrative. Um, and I think we are precariously close to a point where uh, bets from Pakistan may be further hedged against the prospect that the U.S. will get tired, lose patience, and go home. Um, uh, so those are just a few of my thoughts. Um, again, based on um, a long deployment um, in a very long war, and I, I use the term advisedly because for much of the region of the Middle East, uh, it is a war that's, uh, that's at least 200 years old, uh, moving through different phases, uh, we're certainly there now. So I've droned on long enough. I'd be happy to take your questions. And if you have no questions, we can all go watch the ball game. So. so the uh, local procedure here is uh, you stand up at the microphones. There are two microphones on the ground floor and two microphones in the loges. Uh, questions uh, start with your name and affiliation. They secondly, they're short, and third, they end with a question mark. But before going to the audience, I want to see whether Megan O'Sullivan, who was uh, Ryan's colleague uh, through many of these battles, Megan, do you have a comment or question you'd like to make? Maybe just use the, use the microphone over here, if you, if you would. Megan is a professor of practice here and actually teaches a course on uh, Iraq, among other things. So, thanks. Thanks, Graham almost for putting me on the spot here. Uh, Ryan, thank you so much for coming today, and it's a real pleasure to see you in a much more friendly environment than I'm used to. And that's how I qualify the forum to be. I wanted to ask you a question about relationships with powerful 
individuals in the countries. One of the criticisms of the last eight or nine years of foreign policy has been that the Bush administration's policy and strategy was too heavily reliant on relationships with certain individuals. And you were the United States representative to Prime Minister Maliki, President Musharraf, and also President Karzai. And I wondered if you would make a comment about that, maybe whether that's a mischaracterization of our policy, or maybe comment on the perils and the necessities of relying heavily on strong leaders in those environments. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and um, an enduring dilemma. Um, uh, on the one hand, these are the leaders. Um, uh, elected in some cases, in other cases not elected. Uh, uh, so a strong prima facie argument to be made for dealing with those who are in power. Uh, yet the lesson of the Shah is also instructive um, and why it's important to be broadly engaged uh, in any society, uh, broadly informed, and for ambassadors uh, not to enslave themselves uh, to a um, uh, or interpret a policy of support for a given country and its leaders um, as putting on a set of blinders and ignoring everything else that is going on. Uh, I've dealt with all three of those leaders um, uh, at, at different stages. Uh, uh, certainly when I was uh, in Afghanistan, I got there I think when uh, President Karzai, then Chairman Karzai, had been head of the Afghan interim authority for all of two weeks, um, one would not have characterized him as a strong man. Um, he was trying to figure out how you could maybe make the writ of his fledgling government run outside of his palace walls uh, with uh, not huge success in those early days. The same um, criticism was voiced about uh, Prime Minister Maliki, uh, chosen, as you know better than anyone, uh, as a compromise candidate uh, because he was seen as someone who would not be strong and assertive. Uh, and there were a number of voices raised, including at one point my own, uh, that Maliki was too weak to get the job done. Um, we have now fast forwarded to a point where his opponents are calling him the new Saddam, um, which he manifestly isn't, but I do see certain similarities to past Iraqi rulers like Abdul Karim Qasim who led the 58 coup uh, as Maliki uh, makes alliances here, uh, comes down hard on opponents there, picks up those same opponents uh, uh, to use against his former allies and so forth. Um, so I would say neither of them fit a classic strongman model. Uh, Musharraf did. Um, yet Musharraf was also aware uh, during my tenure um, that he would not have the support of Pakistan forever and that he needed to transition uh, away from direct rule in uniform. And without going into uh, detail that is still sensitive, uh, an effort was underway while I was ambassador uh, to help with that transition. Um, um, uh, it didn't go quite as scripted, whatever does in that part of the world, uh, but uh, ultimately, of course, it did involve uh, Musharraf stepping down. So again, you, you've got to deal with what is while not being blinkered to where that may take you um, and to look for creative alternatives. And again, I, I think um, first two cases, uh, uh, for all their imperfections, um, these are not are certainly not now strong man regimes. And in the case of Musharraf, he himself saw the need to, to move on to something else. Gentleman on the left, please. Thank you. My name is Ewan McDougall. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. You made the point that certain regional actors in the Middle East would have reason to question our staying power. And some people would argue that the recent wars have been a distraction from more long-term threats, like the, from greater powers such as Russia, China, and the rise. Um, it would seem to me that a way of addressing those might be to establish a military presence in the region where we're in the countries that we're involved in currently for the foreseeable future, strategic crossroads addressing some of these other great powers. And also it would send a message that we were going to stick to the region and had a vested interest for the long term. Uh, what do you think the prospects are for that? And what do you think the pros and cons of uh, military pres presence in those countries for the foreseeable future would be? 
it, it's a great question. Um, uh, the answer is we already have it. Um, uh, it. It runs pretty much below the radar, and that's a good thing. But we, we have had a naval pro, uh, presence associated with Bahrain for over 50 years. Um, uh, the uh, air hub we have in Qatar was absolutely vital to our prosecution both of Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan and Operation Iraqi Freedom in Iraq. Uh, as our facilities both um, for our air and ground forces in Kuwait. Um, um, they have been there for some time. I would expect them to go on for some time. Um, uh, they are not issues uh, within the domestic politics uh, of these countries, uh, broadly speaking, nor within their immediate region. Um, um, it makes the Iranians um, nervous and unhappy, and that's probably a good thing. Um, uh, but I, I, I think that is what I would look to for a long-term uh, footprint. Uh, we were very careful in our negotiations with Iraq to say right from the outset we did not seek permanent military facilities. Uh, and as Brett alluded, there is a history to this. Um, the, the British presence, the negotiations with the British, the, the Treaty of Portsmouth of 1948, of whom almost no one in this country has heard of, but it brought down Iraq's first Shia prime minister because it was seen as too favorable to the British, uh, is not a chapter in history we want to repeat. So we'll see where we are come 2011. Um, uh, uh, these agreements call for us to be out. Uh, President Bush made that clear when they went into effect. President Obama has made it clear that he intends to abide by them. Um, uh, but I think we are postured uh, for the long term through a set of uh, negotiated agreements with other countries that um, uh, ensure that uh, we are around as long as we need to be. Ladies, please. Hi there. Um, I'm Rizwana Bashir, and I'm um, doing my MBA at the Harvard Business School. I had a couple of questions. The first was... Um, oh, excuse me, just one question. Oh, okay. Thank All right, you. okay. Um, my question is about Afghanistan. Um, and um, when we went in, in 2001, we kind of, I feel that we may have over-promised when it came to certainly women's rights. And looking at what President Karzai's recently been doing, he's basically signed in law that legitimizes almost domestic abuse for Shiite um, women. I'm just wondering what you think will happen um, in the coming couple of years and how we might be able to reestablish rights for women. Yeah, that's a great question because it gets at a broader question even. Um, um, what, what are our goals uh, in Afghanistan? And this is what the president now needs to articulate, and I hope he does it soon. Um, is it narrow counterterrorism? Is it a broader counterinsurgency? Uh, is it a very broad, multifaceted effort at nation building? Um, uh, I don't know where he's going to come out. Uh, the uh, issue of uh, women's rights and protection of women in Afghanistan, I think, comes in that third category. Um, and it's a question in my mind whether this administration and indeed the American people are, are going to be prepared to make that very broad commitment. I mean, I don't know. We'll have to see what comes out of Washington. Um, but again, it's actions and consequences. I am not an expert on Afghanistan, uh, but I have heard from uh, those who are that. In, in, in some respects, the period of the Soviet occupation was a good time for women, at least in urban areas. Um, uh, and then came the backlash when the Mujahideen moved in, um, uh, and then, of course, the Taliban. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're going to set out on these paths, um, <coughs> You, you had better be darn sure that you have the commitment and the resources to see them through, or the people you are trying to help may be in a worse position as a result of your efforts than had you never started. Lady in the balcony, please. Hi, my name is Alana Kessler. I'm an um, MPP student at the Kennedy School. I was hoping you could speak a little bit to the um, culture and the, of the institution of the State Department in terms of, do you th think that the State Department is well suited to deal with current challenges of being culturally savvy and um, taking the long view 
Um, and if you don't think that it's yet suited for those challenges, what changes would you like to see made? I, I think it is. Um, I would comment more narrowly on the Foreign Service. Um, um, the, the, the main problem of the Foreign Service is its size. You, there are about 6,400 uh, generalist Foreign Service officers that cover the world. Um, uh, recent studies have indicated that um, we're, we're short by a figure that approaches that number. Probably 4,700 more are needed uh, to meet day-to-day -day needs around the world and content complex contingencies like uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, we just don't have the people, and I commend both administrations, uh, the previous one for starting the process, the current one for carrying it through to significantly increase those resources because we've paid a price, not only in unfilled positions and difficulties in getting enough people quickly enough uh, where there is great need, like Iraq, uh, but also in language training. You know, we haven't had the people for what the military calls a training float. Uh, uh, that, I think, will now start to change. Uh, but again, uh, when you consider what a plus-up of our military costs and what a much smaller but critical plus-up of our diplomacy costs, uh, uh, it is, uh, I think, just a, a great shame that we have not moved before this, but we are moving now. Uh, in terms of um, uh, a more qualitative uh, issue, uh, the Foreign Service does embody enormous uh, area, cultural, and linguistic expertise. Um, uh, I think it's important for Foreign Service officers not to assume that they are the sole custodians of all knowledge about the outside world. Um, uh, uh, we need to be open uh, to outside experts, uh, to our colleagues in the military and in other branches of the government. Uh, the military does a better job of this, frankly, than, than the Foreign Service does. I think we're making progress, but there's more we need to do in, in terms of reaching out to those who may know different and better than we do. Let me just add a, a footnote from an old Defense Department. that I, uh, There are more musicians in the U.S. military than there are Foreign Service officers. Just to make right. Now that's literally true. There are more people whose job it is to play in the bands and I like the bands very much, but the notion that we should have 6,400 foreign service officers doing the jobs that are being done is just uh, lu lunacy, I believe. So please. Uh, hello, my name is um, Kosha Klamoyski, and I'm a sophomore at the college. Um, you briefly talked about the Kerry Luger bill, which was signed yesterday, giving Pakistan $7.5 billion in aid over five years. and. The Pakistani government has criticized it for being a policy of U.S. micromanagement of their civil and military affairs. At the same time, they've also recently appointed General Kayani to lead a large ground force to stop the recent wave of terrorism. So given our complex history with Pakistan, what do you think are our future steps that will balance Pakistan's need for autonomy and our security interests in that region? Uh, and it's a great question. I'd add a third element, uh, uh, necessary accountability for substantial amounts of the taxpayer's money. Uh, I think that can be blended. Um, the Pakistanis are pretty sophisticated. Uh, the current generation of leadership, both military and civilian, knows us pretty well. The military um, leadership studied in our, our schools, many of them multiple times. Uh, uh, so they, they, they know sort of how we work. I, I think we are overly conditioned, uh, and I, um, uh, I am not sure, uh, since this is now legislation, um, uh, how you walk that back a bit. But um, uh, I think we've got we've to work with the Pakistanis and find a way forward uh, that will allow these funds to be dispersed uh, but in a way that the Pakistanis find as sustainable and acceptable in terms of conditionality. Um, some of what they're doing right now, what they're saying, I think is uh, in part, uh, again, playing to local audiences. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
good sign. It means public opinion counts. Uh, but some of it is very deeply felt. And uh, again, I think the conditionality, given our history, um, because it's not simply that they feel their sovereignty has been affronted, as I, as I tried to suggest. It's because they see this as a replay of the process that led to the Pressler Amendment and, and sanctions against Pakistan for their nuclear program. And that, I think, is dangerous for both of us. This gentleman, please. Thank you for coming here today, Ambassador Crocker. My name is Chris Holliday, and I'm a junior here at the college. Um, Afghans often cite a history of thwarting conquest by stronger nations such as that of Alexander the Great, the British Empire, uh, the Soviet Union, and now even the US and NATO. Um, to what extent do nationalism and the belief of an Afghan ability to deny outsiders a role in their affairs drive the insurgency in Afghanistan? Uh, that, that's a, it's an important question. It's not one I'm, I'm, I'm really fully qualified to answer because I have not been intimately involved in Afghanistan in recent years. Um, I, I certainly have seen some of the same um, uh, things that many of you have seen. Uh, polling is not an exact science anywhere, and it certainly isn't in a place like Afghanistan. But what I am reading is that, um, uh, broadly speaking, the U.S. is not perceived as a, uh, a hostile force of occupation by the Afghan public. And that's also what I, uh, what I pick up from uh, friends I know who are out there, that this, um, uh, it is certainly something the Taliban plays on, uh, uh, but I, I don't sense that we, we have a growing wave of Afghan opinion that sees us as the occupier and the enemy by, by any means. Now, my own view is that uh, as policy is recalibrated, uh, it is going to be important to demonstrate to the Afghans that um, we are there for their benefit. Um, uh, and I certainly wouldn't suggest that you just take what was done in Iraq and you apply it in Afghanistan, but certain principles are important. The, um, the use of the U.S. military uh, for the protection of the people, which became its primary mission under the surge, uh, is something, again, that General McChrystal has been talking about for some time. And I, I think it's important to do that because it is through those actions um, that the, uh, the assertions of the Taliban uh, become more and more transparent and less and less convincing. Hi, my name is Tufi Khwairi. I'm a first year student at HBS. My question is, uh, what key strategic interests shape U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, particularly in Iraq and Lebanon? And is the naturalization of the 500,000 Palestinian refugees currently residing in Lebanon one objective that is being currently sought? Thank you. No. <laughs> no, absolutely it is not. Uh, uh, again, I, I had two tours in Lebanon, uh, six years altogether. It is a... Um, uh, a country I, I know and admire greatly. Um, uh, what we want to see is what we have said through successive uh, uh, administrations, uh, a stable and democratic Lebanon. Uh, and there have been some encouraging developments recently. The process of forming a government after the recent elections has been um, painful in the extreme, but I'm encouraged that the Lebanese keep at it. Um, I think that process is necessary. Um, uh, the, uh, the question of the Palestinian uh, uh, community in Lebanon, of course, is a highly sensitive one. Uh, and estimates of numbers vary hugely from the figure you cited uh, to 200,000 or less. I don't know what the number is. Um, uh, they will have to be accommodated in some fashion uh, in ways differ, that differ from the way they're living now. Because uh, although it's faded from the headlines, um, uh, conditions in those camps are, to put it mildly, not good um, and, and not, uh, I think, a, a sustainable status quo for the future. Uh, there are other issues that um, uh, have assumed greater urgency uh, but I would like to think that in conditions in which uh, Lebanon asserts its, its full sovereignty 
in conditions of sustainable stability in a democratic process um, that the question of the Palestinian presence there can be dealt with in a way that is acceptable to both Lebanese and Palestinians. And I do not see that, and I would underscore it, uh, I do not see that uh, as the naturalization in Lebanon um, of whatever size that community is. This gentleman. Um, thank you, Ambassador Crocker. I was wondering, having um, been on the ground with a, to date, very successful counterinsurgency, somewhat successful counterinsurgency in, in Iraq, um, your feelings on if a counterinsurgency strategy or surge in Afghanistan can be successful with the Karzai government, especially with its lack of legitimacy in the recently disputed election? Uh, th that, that, too, is an important question. Um, uh, and it, it falls under my counsel to try to see the region in its own terms, not apply uh, our own judgments and optics to it. Um, in, in the case of the elections, uh, we, we have to be, and we, I, I mean the international community broadly, um, uh, we may have views, uh, but it's what the Afghans think about those elections that is absolutely crucial. And I have heard, um, including in recent Senate testimony uh, that I was part of, um, uh, Afghans speak of a government that is lacking legitimacy, but it's not because of the elections. Um, it's, it's services, it's security, it's, it's basic stability. Um, I, I think these may be the issues of profound legitimacy for the Afghans, uh, what the government does, not how the election was run. Um, uh, again, I'm not in a position to say that uh, with, uh, with final authority, but again, what are the Afghans uh, saying and thinking and doing about the elections? Because the sense I have is what they want is a government, some government, any government, simply to get on with the business of governing. Uh, and I think that's where we can make a significant difference. Let, let me ask you if you would say another word or two, though, Ryan. If, 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 if it were the case that, we, that, uh, that the Afghan people did not think that the, Kar, the, the Karzai government was uh, legitimate and credible for the combination of reasons that include its performance in the past as well as if they concluded that the, the election was substantially stolen. So, Suppose, just hypothetically, two-thirds of Afghans uh, thought the government was not uh, credible and legitimate. Is that a conceivable partner for a full-fledged coin effort? Or when you're looking at what you're, you, do you have to say, well, I would like to do this if I had a partner, but if I don't have a partner, I can't avoid looking like an occupier. How, how would you deal with that? Because you certainly thought about that sure. in the Iraqi case. Yeah, uh, uh, again, we're all trained as diplomats never to answer a hypothetical, but I'm not one anymore, so it's kind of fun. Uh, 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 clearly, a government that is seen as illegitimate by a substantial majority of its own people is in deep trouble. Um, I, I can't chart where that would go. Uh, but it would go nowhere good. Now, I, I sense just reading media reports that um, for whatever reason, now Karzai and his supporters are moving toward the notion of a second round in any case. Um, that, that strikes me as um, probably pretty smart as a way of defusing this whole issue. There was, um, again, it's kind of like Watergate, uh, you know, why, <laughs> Why steal stuff you don't need to steal uh, when the outcome was going to be fairly clear in any case? So, Richard Nixon <laughs> asked that several times, but still, you want to win big. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, not not to uh, make more than a facetious comparison, obviously, but um, uh, certainly if they do move to a second round and that is conducted under, um, uh, say, better circumstances in the first round, I think this whole thing can be diffused. This gentleman. Thank you very much for a very thoughtful analysis. My name is Ahmed Jalal. I'm a first year Kennedy School student. My question to you is, uh, um, the U.S. has a policy of promoting democracy. And yet on 3rd November 2007, when General Musharraf imposed martial law, and he imprisoned the Chief Justices and Supreme Court Justice of the country, the U.S. government sided by the military dictator against the people of Pakistan. And then subsequently, when people, civil society protested, and these are the moderate, educated Pakistani people who would be 
the West's best ally in fighting the ideology of Talibanization and Al-Qaeda, the United States government sided with the military dictator. My question to you is, uh, I want you at the United States to succeed in Pakistan and across the Middle East, but how can the United States succeed if there's such a big discrepancy between its stated values that it espouses and what it wants for other people of the world and actually its policy and actually what it does? Uh, again, a very important question, and I'll, I'll give you two answers. First, the broad one. Um, you know, uh, America is, in many respects, almost a unique country and society in that um, uh, we are founded on a set of principles, um, sometimes termed American exceptionalism. Um, these are principles that, by their very definition, are absolute. They apply to us, but they're universal principles they apply to the world. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, what, what are your obligations uh, and your responsibilities as uh, the leaders of such a country vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world? Um, you know, do you uh, take it as a universal mandate to make the principles of American exceptionalism available to every part of the world you can reach? Uh, some would say that's the essence of the Bush doctrine um, uh, for Iraq. Um, uh, are, are you necessarily more conservative and more nuanced? Um, uh, and this is a dilemma for us. Uh, in, that's, I think, the broad issue uh, uh, for an American administration, any American administration, and for the public um, that is ultimately responsible for uh, who gets elected. Now, in the case of Pakistan, uh, the uh, dismissal of the Chief Justice, uh, which happened right at the end of my uh, time in, um, in Pakistan, was a colossal mistake um, um, that I think was tacitly acknowledged uh, by the government at the time. Um, but as I alluded to earlier, there was a process already underway um, uh, necessarily done very quietly to set the stage for um, a peaceful transfer of power uh, from a military leader to civilian leadership through an election. Uh, so if you're making the policy calls, do you want to jeopardize that process for the sake of principle in the near term? Um, uh, I was not responsible for how that was carried out, but I think we did um, uh, about the best we could do under those circumstances, uh, which was to tell Musharraf privately that that was idiotic, uh, but to continue with the process that um, ultimately did lead to Benazir Bhutto's return. It's, I just would say this for any of you who are thinking about careers in um, international affairs for the US. Um, uh, you will be entering a world of um, uh, almost all bad choices, certainly tough choices. Um, uh, it, is, it, is, it is almost never black and white. Um, and again, those choices entail consequences. And, and thinking through those, both consequences of action and consequences of inaction, um, uh, it's, um, it's challenging to say the least. A great lesson for, uh, for writing down, but again, I would just emphasize, as, as Brett did in the introduction, uh, what a fantastic thing to have a chance to even struggle with those bad choices as you've had in the course of this career. Unfortunately, we have time for only two last questions, which are the two that are up, this gentleman and this lady, and I apologize, but you're next. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Crocker, for visiting us today. Uh, my name is Sumit. I'm a first year at the Kennedy School. Um, so two reasons why I think the violence numbers in Iraq went down, in my opinion, is because of the troop surge and probably more importantly, the Anbar awakening, where you had about 100,000 Sunni insurgents who were once shooting at us switching sides. Um, now my concern is that as US troops withdraw from Iraq, uh, most recently at the end of June, and as the bases close in Anbar province, um, that relationship is going to be lost, and it's not going to be seamlessly transferred between the uh, Sunnis and the Shia. So my question is, what do you see the future of these 100,000 Sunni militiamen 
some of whom have integrated in the Iraqi security forces, but many of whom have not, and who are still vying for political power and resources within the Shia-led government. Uh, that's uh, yet another reason why this upcoming election, I think, is so important. And what we're seeing is uh, uh, some figures, a number of figures, from this awakening trying to figure out how to position themselves to benefit from these elections. And uh, they're appearing on a variety of different electoral lists. Um, uh, some are not. Um, uh, again, life moves on and we're in a period of transition. Uh, uh, what uh, I think we have made clear is that, uh, yes, we are drawing down. Uh, the surge is over. Uh, there is a timetable with an end date. It's laid out in those agreements. Uh, we will certainly continue to use our influence, uh, of which there are substantial amounts remaining, uh, to do everything we can to ensure that the political process moves forward uh, peacefully and positively. But it is an Iraqi political process. and. Uh, awakening movements and its leaders uh, need to figure out how to uh, transform what had been military power into political power in a very fluid situation. Again, some of them are doing it. Um, new Sunni alliances are forming. What is particularly heartening, I think, is some of these cross-sectarian alliances that do involve awakening leaders uh, with elements of the, uh, uh, the Shia political landscape. And look, it's, politics is a rough game anywhere. Uh, uh, some are gonna lose out. Uh, but what I don't see is the potential for a reignition uh, of an insurgency as a result. And I don't think they see it either. Thank you. This has to be the last question. Thank you. Rima Mary, I'm a fellow at the Carr Center. Uh, Ambassador Crocker, I've been looking with fear and alarm on the escalation of violence between Israel and Lebanon recently. And the last couple of days, you know that Israel bombed a Hezbollah home because they were in violation, they were arming and in, in, in violation of 1701. And Israel at the same time is a roaming Lebanese sky is also in violation of 1701. So I want to move beyond that blame game and look at the bigger picture. What are some of the lesson, lessons that the U.S. administration learned dealing with Hezbollah post July 2006? And what are some of the measures that are taking place to make sure that we don't fall into that trap again? Uh, well, again, complex issues, hard choices, and often not choices we're even in a position to make. Uh, uh, Hezbollah is a very complex organization. Uh, in part, it is um, um, an indigenous Lebanese movement uh, that has stood for elections and has won seats, as we saw in these past elections, um, and will likely be part of a government. On the other hand, um, it is uh, an armed organization operating outside the authority of the Lebanese state uh, supported again by Tehran and Damascus. Uh, uh, can they have it both ways indefinitely? I'd like to think not, and I would like to think that we will see a progressive transformation of Hezbollah into a truly indigenous Lebanese organization uh, that sees uh, declining benefit from uh, uh, the violence with which it is associated and its foreign patronage, but that clearly hasn't happened yet. Um, uh, the 2006 episode, um, not a happy time. Uh, not for Israel, not for Lebanon, and not for friends of both, such as the United States. I would hope that uh, we've all learned something from that experience, uh, uh, including Hezbollah, uh, uh, and we will not see a reignition of that kind of violence because they have the capability to do so. Uh, if they find it in their interest, or if Tehran or Damascus finds it in theirs, uh, because it is a significant armed group, again, operating outside the authority of the state, and until that dynamic changes, and it's not one we can change, uh, that potential for uh, uh, a further pain and suffering for the peoples of both Lebanon uh, and Israel is very much present. Let me remind you that if you look at the back of your program, Next Wednesday here at the Forum 
At 6 o'clock, there's going to be a session that basically continues from the, from the final question, which is on human rights and the Carr Center's 10th anniversary at which the first director, Michael Ignatieff, the first executive director, Samantha Power, and Sarah Sewell will be debating with uh, Rory Stewart, the current director, where is human rights going? And then if you sit still after that, at 8 o'clock, David Axelrod, who's the political advisor to President Obama, will be here. But for today, let's say to one of the great American public servants of the recent generation, thanks to Rory. To, uh, thank you very much. We run a tight ship. Thank you. Thank you all.